Hello guys, welcome to this new session on pharmacogenomics. So you know, each one of us respond differently to our environment, to the food that we eat and to the drugs that we take. The way we respond to the drugs may mean that drug that is effective for one person may be less effective for another person. And that drug that is safe for one person may be dangerous for the another person, even at same dose. So in this particular lecture, we are going to discuss what are the key reasons behind this differential response of individuals towards the drug, that is in pharmacogenomics. So first of all, we are going to discuss differential drug efficacy. Now suppose there is a group of different patients and among those different patients, doctor find out same symptoms, same findings, and he concluded that they have same diseases. So for those same diseases, doctor prescribed same drug with the same doses. But when we observe the effect of that drug into those different patients, the effects are also different because the drug, even if it is efficacious, even if it is effective, but when we prescribe that drug in the same dose in the different individuals, sometimes the drug is most efficacious in some individuals. Maybe in some individuals it is not efficacious. It means uh, it will not uh, treat or it will not cure that particular disease that we call as lack of efficacy. And in some individuals, the drug will be proved to be harmful. That is, unexpected side effect may be observed in those individuals. So that is called as differential drug efficacy. So as drug shows different effects among the different individuals, people react differently to the drugs. In this diagram, you can see there is a group of patients, there is a patient population with same disease phenotype. But we know that there is a genetic variation among all the individuals in the human population. So when we genotype them, they are different responders to the drug. They, their response vary towards the drug. Now you can see the uh, first group with the black color smiley. They are the patient with the drug toxicity. So they show side effects. Then there is another group with a gray color smiley, patients with a non-response to the drug therapy. It means that even if we are prescribing the drug to them, they are taking the drug, but their body do not show any kind of response, neither positive nor negative response towards the drug. So as if, as if we are giving them the placebo. And there is a large uh, group or large portion of individuals in that patient population, they will show normal response to the drug therapy. So we have three different types of responders in that patient group, that is toxic responders, non-responders and responders on the basis of their genetic variation. Now the question arises, why does drug response vary? So there are multiple contributed factors to such variation in drug response, such as gender, age, body mass, diet, ethnicity, pregnancy, then co-medication, that is the presence of other drugs during the treatment or the particular disease and exposure to certain chemicals or toxin. So in, among these all factors, a very most important factor is the genetic factor. Now this factor is due to variation in gene sequence among the individual, we usually denoted as SNP, that is single nucleotide polymorphism. So there are variations among the gene sequence in individuals and that is one of the reason why this drug response vary among the individuals. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss that genetic factor in more detail. Now genetic variation is responsible for this uh, differential drug response. And primarily there are two types of genetic mutation events create all the forms of variation. The first one is single base mutation, which substitute one nucleotide for another that is single nucleotide polymorphism. We have already discussed this concept in detail in the previous lecture. Then there is another type of variation called as insertions and deletions of one or more nucleotide. So that is tandem repeat polymorphism or insertion deletion polymorphism. 
and polymorphism when we call it as a polymorphism that is a genetic variation that is observed at a frequency of greater than 1% in the population then single nucleotide polymorphism i will not go into detail because we have already discussed it snps are single base pair positions in genomic dna at which different sequence alternatives that is alleles exist wherein the least frequent alleles has the abundance of 1% or the greater for example, a SNP might change the DNA sequence. Like in this example, the A is substituted with T. And SNPs are the most commonly occurring genetic differences. So SNPs are very common in human population. Between two individuals, there is an average of one SNP every approximately 1250 basis. So approximately after every 1250 basis, there will be one SNP among two individuals. So most of these have no phenotypic effect because many times they are just present in the non-coding regions. And uh, Venter et al. estimate that only less than 1% of all human SNPs impact protein function. That is lots of uh, in the non-coding region and only less than 1% they are present in the coding region. And some are alleles of the genes also. The next type of variation is a tandem repeat polymorphism. I know that tandem repeats, they are simply the repeats of a nucleotide in the variable number and called as variable number of tandem repeats. They are very common class of polymorphism consisting of variable length of uh, sequence motif that are repeated in tandem in the variable copy number. And actually on the basis of VNTR itself, we uh, proceed for the DNA finger bending technique. So based on the size of the tandem repeat unit, they are called as microsatellites or mini satellites. The microsatellites, they are also called as STR, that is short tandem repeats. The size of these repeats is usually from 1 to 6 nucleotide. Uh, you, uh, in this example, you can see that there is a dinucleotide CA, CA, CA. They are repeated multiple times. And mini satellites, the repeat unit size is large, around 14 to 100 nucleotides. Then next type of variation is insertion or deletion polymorphism called as INDEL. Now this type of polymorphism, they are quite common and widely distributed throughout the human population. Some nucleotides are inserted or deleted that may also result into differential response to the drug. So due to individual variation, 20 to 40 percent of patients benefit from an approved drug. 70 to 80 percent of the drug candidates failed in clinical trials and many approved drugs are removed from the market due to adverse drug effects. So due to this variation in the gene sequence among the individual, only 20 to 40 percent of the patient benefit from the approved drug that is actually being sold in the market. And during clinical trials, when we perform for the uh, newly invented drugs, around 70 to 80 percent of the drug candidate fails because some drug candidates, they are not showing efficacy in the patient group. Some drug candidates, they are showing side effects in the even they are efficacious but they are showing side effects in the group of patients so here in the clinical trial itself 70 to 80 percent of the drug candidates fails and uh, many approved drug approved drugs which are being sold in the market they have to be removed from the market because of adverse drug side effects so that's in the clinical trial phase four that is usually after uh, approval of the drug when it is being sold in the market. The use of DNA sequence information to measure and predict the re reactions of individuals to the drug will lead to personalized drug, faster clinical trials and less drug side effects. And that, that is possible only when we study the pharmacogenetics. So in order to solve this problem of differential uh, drug response of the group of patients, we should look into the branch of science called as pharmacogenetics. The definition of pharmacogenetics is study of inter-individual variation in DNA sequence related to drug absorption and deposition or drug action including polymorphic variation in genes that encode the functions of transporters, metabolizing enzymes, receptors and other proteins. Or the other definition is the study of how people respond differently to medicines due to their genetic inheritance is called as pharmacogenetics or correlating heritable genetic variation to drug response. So in simple words, in pharmacogenetics, 
we study those genes which are responsible for transportation of drug inside the cell or it is a metabolizing enzyme which is actually uh, metabolizing the drug molecules or it may be a receptor present on the cell surface or it may be any other protein involved in the pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics but in pharmacogenetics we usually focus on single gene at a time whichever is responsible for activity of the drug in the patient's body so the ultimate goal of pharmacogenetics is to understand how someone's genetic makeup determines how well a medicine work in his or her body as well as what side effects are likely to occur so in simple term we need to find out right medicine for the right patient then there is another term called as pharmacogenetics so as i have already mentioned in pharmacogenetics we focus on single gene at a time but in pharmacogenomics we study the variability in drug response determined by multiple genes within the genome so in pharmacogenetic uh, sorry genomics it is the study of how genes affect the person's response to the drug and it is a science that examines the inherited variation in genes that uh, dictate drug response and explore the way in which these variations can be used to predict whether a patient will have uh, a good response to, to the drug or a bad response to the drug or no response at all to the drug so this term that pharmacogenomics actually comes uh, from two words one is pharmacology that is the science of drugs and other term is genomics that is the study of genes and their function and thus the intersection of pharmaceutical and genetics is pharmacogenomics so uh, the researchers in the field of pharmacogenomics they study genes that produce drug metabolizing enzymes in the body because many drugs are altered by the body by metabolizing enzymes and in some cases the active drug is made inactive or less active through the metabolism or vice versa so there are multiple uh, factors which we have to study under the pharmacogenomics so as you can see here pharmacogenetics is a study of variation in genes that determine an individual's response to drug therapy but here we usually focus on the single gene now what type of genetic variations we study in the pharmacogenetics that is uh, snps indel variations and vntrs and uh, then we find out the potential target genes that are those that encode drug metabolizing enzyme look this drug metabolizing enzyme will metabolize the drug either they will convert into more active form or less active form and we also study the genes responsible for the transportation of drug inside the cell as well as the proteins which are working as a drug target then determinants of drug efficacy and toxicity so there are various uh, factors which are responsible for a uh, drug to be efficacious or uh, toxic to the patient so patient's response to the drug may depend on the factor that can vary according uh, to the genetic variation that is according to the presence of particular type of allele so there are two levels at which these factors plays a very critical role one is pharmacokinetics and pharmaco dynamics so in pharmacokinetics there is absorption distribution metabolism and elimination of the drug so when the dose is administered it is absorbed in the patient body then concentration in systemic circulation that is uh, when the drug is administered its concentration is maintained in the blood then it is distributed drug in the tissue of distribution it reaches to the tissue via blood circulation and later on it is eliminated from the body it is metabolized by the liver and then it is excreted then comes pharmacodynamic factors that is target protein or downstream messengers now when drug reaches to the particular target tissue it shows some uh, action at that particular target site that is called as pharmacological effect now that effect may be toxic or it may be a uh, positive effect which is responsible for curing the disease now these are different factors which determine the drug efficacy and toxicity 
So this pharmacogenomics will allow us for the individualized or personalized medication that will be based on genetically determined variation in effect and side effect. So this field of pharmacogenomics is still in its early stages. It's possible that millions of genetic variation may exist. We don't know and identifying those new variations will take many years. If it's even possible, that is going to take time. In addition, how you respond to a medication may not be determined by just one gene, but rather by many genes interacting with each other. And combining through this complicated genetic map is very expensive and it is time consuming. Although the use of pharmacogenomics is currently quite limited, but new approaches are under study in clinical trials. And in the future, this field will allow to develop the tailored drug, that is personalized drugs, to treat the wide range of health problems, including cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, HIV, AIDS, or asthma. So use of medication otherwise rejected because of side effects. Sometimes we reject the drug because it is showing side effects. And uh, more accurate methods of determining appropriate doses can be developed by using this pharmacogenomics knowledge in the drug discovery or development. Usually we perform genetic testing for two reasons. One is to identify the genetic disease and other application is in pharmacogenetics. So while we perform genetic testing for disease genetics or disease prognostics or diagnostic, we test for rare Mendelian disease and we try to find out that which is the causal gene for this disease or we may perform it for the common complex diseases. We try to find out whether the gene is susceptible for the mutation or whether the gene is susceptible for the development of those genetic diseases in the future or not. Then in pharmacogenetics, we try to find out the genes for drug metabolism and action. Also, we try to find out the SNP profile, that is the polymorphism profile for drug metabolism and or action. Now, what are the benefits in uh, genetic testing and genetic diseases? The benefits are new disease insights are gained and we can develop the future medicines for that. And a, a potential application of genetic testing in pharmacogenetics is we can optimize the medicine response among the different individuals with the genetic variation. That's the benefit of genetic testing in pharmacogenetics. There are many challenges in drug designing. As you can see in this example, different biochemical pathways can lead to the same disease. There are two individuals, Tom and Perry. In Tom, pathway A results into the progression into hypertension. In Perry, pathway C is resulting into the hypertension. Various enzymes are involved in those pathways. There is third pathway called as pathway B, which is also resulting into the hypertension. So suppose, we have developed drugs for two of the pathways, that is pathway A and pathway C. Drug X is targeting enzyme 3 of the pathway A and drug Y is targeting enzyme 9 of the pathway C. Now suppose doctor prescribed drug X to all individuals. Now that will be only effective among those individuals which has pathway A resulting into hypertension. It will not be efficacious among the individuals which have pathway C or pathway B. Then if the doctor prescribed drug Y, then it will be only efficacious in the individuals which have uh, developed hypertension by the pathway C. It will not be effective in pathway B and pathway A. And even if both of the drugs uh, are prescribed one at a time among the individuals, which have pathway B, neither of the drug will be effective because the drug is not affecting on the enzymes of the pathway B. So these are some basic challenges in the drug design. Now these drug responses are genetics, means they are linked with some sort of genes uh, involved in the disease progression. So this drug metabolism or response can be monogenic. It means drug is targeting on the single gene or a single enzyme encoded by the gene and it altered the key metabolizing enzyme, it will alter the drug's effect. Or the drug responses are polymorphic, 
like drug will trigger the downstream event and those downstream event will be different among different individuals so there will be variation in that uh, downstream events this is the drug response curve on x axis there is prime on the drug and on y axis there is degree of response to the drug so as time progresses some individuals shows mean response some individuals show mean good response and some individuals show mean poor response so again there is even if all the responders are showing positive response to the drug but again on the basis of uh, the doses of the drug on the basis of time it has spent into the body drug response will be different now these variations in drug responses is hereditary and this variation may be at any level of pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics that is uh, individuals may show variation in absorption rates they may show, show variation in drug metabolism or in drug inactivation or elimination or variation in target receptors so these are all uh, different points at which individuals show variation to the drug response now this is the genetic polymorphism in disease modifying or treatment modifying genes that can influence drug response so these are the genes which you have identified these are either genes or gene product that we have identified and uh, what are their what are their response associated with the drug or during that disease is shown in this table this is also the same genetic polymorphism in drug target genes that can influence the drug responses so in this lecture we are going to discuss a very prominent example of a drug called as warfarin which is sold under the brand name of comadine and it is the medication that is used as an anticoagulant now anticoagulant is actually a blood thinner it is commonly used to treat blood clots such as uh, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism and to prevent strokes in the people who have arterial fibrillation or uh, vulvar heart disease or artificial heart wall and less commonly it is used uh, following the segment elevation myocardial infraction and orthopedic surgery so it is generally taken by mouth but may also be used by injection into the vein now the question is how this warfarin works so warfarin inhibit vitamin k reductase which is the enzyme responsible for uh, recycling oxidated vitamin k back into the system and for this reason drug in this class are also referred to as vitamin k antagonist now you can see in the biochemical reaction that uh, vitamin k which is present in the reduced form it is oxidized by the enzyme carboxylase into vitamin k epoxide now this vitamin k which is a epoxide which is oxidized form it is again reduced into vitamin k reduced form by the enzyme vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme now this reduced form of vitamin k is uh, responsible for conversion of precursor prothrombin into biologically active prothrombin resulting into the blood clot but this drug warfarin is going to inhibit the vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme so that vitamin k in the reduced form will not be available in the patient's body and blood clot will not be formed so that is how the warfarin drug works it prevent the thrombosis now this warfarin it was discovered 60 years ago and one of the most widely prescribed drug in the world intended to prevent and treat thromboembolism recurrent stroke pulmonary embolism or heart wall prosthesis there are multi source uh, anticoagulants so we can prescribe this drug in the various doses like 1 2 2.5 to 10 mg tablet strength and its significant increase in the prescription over the past 10 years especially in the elderly persons so this is a trend of warfarin use there is a 1.5 fold increase in the uses of this tablet in the us now let us discuss the safety of warfarin as we know that warfarin is a blood thinner it is an anticoagulant 
it prevent the formation of the blood clots so the major risk among the individuals consuming warfarin is internal bleeding and that internal bleeding may be frequent to severe out of 100 patients who are consuming warfarin 1.2 to 7% shows major episodes of bleeding and uh, it is also responsible for 1 in 10 hospital admissions due to internal bleeding the relative risk of fatal extracranial bleeding due to consumption of warfarin is around 0 to 4.8 percent then dna testing for warfarin sensitivity so uh, fda clinical pharmacological subcommittee of the advisory committee for the pharmaceutical science has recommended testing for the variation in cyp2c9 and VKORC1 gene in the patients requiring warfarin therapy. The drug label will reflect this recommendation soon. Now, why this genetic testing has to be performed before consumption of the warfarin in the US? So, in order to understand this, we should understand the metabolism of warfarin in the patient's body. Among individuals, there are two polymorphic genes. One is CYP2C9 and other is VKORC1. It affects the warfarin metabolism and response. So allelic frequencies of these two genes are usually associated with the ethnicity. Here, there are concern with prescribing warfarin to patients with CYP2C9 or VKORC1 polymorphism. Because overdose of this medicine among those individuals may result into bleeding, which can be fatal, or underdose or the lower dose, it can result into thrombosis, which can be also fatal. So here we are going to discuss the variants of two polymorphic genes, that is CYP2C9 and VKORC1. Firstly, we discuss VKORC1. Now, it's a polymorphism that may explain up to 25% of patients' variability in the response to warfarin. The patients which have VKORC1 polymorphism, they are at the risk for exaggerated anticoagulant response. So the blood thinning will be more in the individuals we have, who have VKORC1 allele present in their body. And that will result into excessive bleeding, that is excessive anticoagulation response in the patient's body. Then another polymorphic allele that is present is CYP2C9 and there are some other alleles with single amino acid substitution are also present but the CYP2C9 variant take more time to achieve stable dosing and they are associated with the increased risk of bleeding events. Low CYP2C9 activity results into higher plasma levels of warfarin so the patient is at a risk for the bleeding here. So, the few individuals which have this CYP2C9 polymorphism or VKORC1 polymorphism genes, they are sensitive for the warfarin. This warfarin sensitivity can be tested by testing the uh, allelic versions among the individuals for the specific variation in this CYP2C9 or VKORC1 genes that confer sensitivity to warfarin and does significantly reduce the required maintenance dose. Now, the CYP2C9 is involved in warfarin metabolism and VKORC1 influences warfarin's anticoagulation effect through vitamin K. So, if we test this variation among the individuals, the doses can be uh, manipulated according to their genetic variation. So, this is the example through which we can understand the role of pharmacogenomics in the medicines or personalized medicines. Thank you very much.